sort of going to wait for John and Elizabeth. I knew they weren't here because the water isn't here. <laughs> George Bernard Shaw wrote, better keep yourself clean and bright because you're the window through which you see the world. <laughs> he certainly was a clean and bright one. You know, he was a music critic of the London Times at one time. And only last week I read where he said, nothing soothes me more after a long and arduous season of pianoforte recitals than to sit and have my teeth drilled. <laughs> Wouldn't that be soothing? <clears throat> Anyway, um, last night we got you equipped with the abstracts and I thought we would be very practical about it tonight. <clears throat> Pardon me, I seem to have... My frog is up for a curtain call. Yeah. <clears throat> the... Um, Someone asked earlier, and I'm looking for you, would I cover that a certain aspect about the body? Where have you gone? Here. Oh, there you are. Thanks. Yeah, I'm again. What, what, was, what was your question? And we, we can do it before we begin. It may help gel that. Uh, I just didn't get all the, uh, the information down for each part of the body that you gave. Which one they... Well, then I think Pat, in, in that case, I, did, I know several did take it down. So... Come to me immediately afterwards, and I'll show it to you exactly as I have it on the page. That'll be easy. Right. Okay. We're going to make it very practical. You know, when Jesus rides into Jerusalem, he enters the temple, whips out the arrows, values change, and then he starts teaching by parables. So I thought we would start and be very practical and teach by parables. Only, we'll start with the Old Testament, because it shows the way of doing it, told as everything is told in the language of persons in places doing things, but it's always, that is symbolic of what is the essence. So, if you are taking notes, we're now in the second king, book, the fourth chapter of the second kings. I always say second kings four if that's any easier for anyone. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not a thing in this house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her. And she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, Go, sell that oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. It's the means, you see. It's the technique of how to do it. And when Verne spoke about Liberace having such an intense desire to play to thousands, it was such an intense desire that physically he rented the Hollywood Bowl and imagined that he was playing to thousands. Well, I'm saying that that must be a fantastically powerfully developed imagination to sit there and face several thousand empty seats and imagine them full. Anyone that can do that can sit at home and imagine himself in the Hollywood Bowl playing to thousands. 
I'm not criticizing the means. I'm not criticizing any, any method that makes it, that awakens in you the feeling is perfectly legitimate. I'm wondering, I mean, he must have had means at hand because you don't rent the Hollywood Bowl for 10 cents. Come in. You're not the last, I'm sure. So this is, in a sense, I've taken this one from Second Kings 4 because it illustrates that use of the principle, that priming the pump, I call it. So the widow, here is a, here's a widow. This simply means that sense of yourself which has lost its sense of provision. The husband is dead. That's what she says to Elisha, my husband is dead. Incidentally, Elisha is vision of God. You can look that up in Strong if you want. That's where I got it. So she says to Elisha, thy servant, my husband, is dead. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. My two sons, my cherished ideals. Elisha said unto her, well, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you got in the house? There we start. This is the principle always. You have to start with what you have. And what you truly have is what's on that vertical rod of the cross. What you have is growing in the tree of life. So you start with what you have. All she knew of what there was there was, I have not anything in the house save a pot of oil. And oil is dedication. Well, if you've got that, you've got a lot. So he said, go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors. Now these are the desires. You borrow desires. I mean, you, 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 I don't really mean, you've got the desire. But what you borrow is a scene that implies that that desire is a fulfilled condition. You construct, as Neville says, a scene which, if true, implies that what you wish is already a going thing. So those are the empty vessels. They're empty because they don't have you believing them yet. Borrow not a few. Don't limit yourself. Somebody said, if I had another thousand dollars, I'd be over the hump. There was a lady in Los Angeles that was a practicing attorney, she and her husband both, and she said that in all their years of practice, she found that everybody had one thing in common. No matter whether it was the owner of, she was a personal, she was, uh, W.K. Kellogg was one of her clients and he was worth millions and there were those who couldn't pay next month's rent. And she said they all had one thing in common. One more thousand dollars would put them over the hump. <laughs> so borrow not a few. Don't limit yourself and say one more thousand will do it. If you're going to borrow, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons. In other words, you who are and your cherished ideals, which are on the vertical rod are in a sense closeted away from that literal interpreting and then you shall pour out into those vessels and when they're full set them aside which she did do and then when there were no more vessels to fill in other words it seems that it was very satisfactory things have now been played out just the way I would like them to be she goes to Elisha and tells him of it. He says, go, sell thou and thy children, since the creditor can't take them. They're with you to live. On the rest of it. Well, what's the rest of it? If you're going to sell everything you've poured out, what you've got left is what you had when you started. In other words, you do not increase infinitude. You don't make it any bigger and you can't shrink it. Nothing you can do to it. You're left with what you had, which was his original question. What have you got in the house? That's why it's possible to prove your wholeness, to prove your security. It may be dramatized as wealth or poverty, but you can prove your security because it's in you. You have to look and see what you have in the house. Take account of stock. And whatever it is you think you need, if you look in the house, you'll find the ideal of it then understanding that you have it, you can illustrate it. 
Now, I know he gave this illustration in that. If I'm not quoting, I don't intend to quote it because I can't. But the idea is this. If I write a book that has 200 Fs in it and I read a book, let us say I do it the other way. I'll read one that has 400 Fs and I write one that uses 700. Am I overdrawn? There's only one F and it's in you. No teacher gave it to you. It wasn't whittled out of wood and passed across or exchanged for dollars. It is awakened in you. You saw the image and then you write as many as you will and you won't be without. You can't reduce the supply of Fs. There's only one anyway. It's the same thing with dollars. If you could understand that every dollar you put out is an illustration of this substance that I have, that I am, then you would never have any sense of depleting your store. You wouldn't be running short. You wouldn't be depleting the store. <clears throat> what hast thou in the house? Everything is done from that. And if you've got it, and you have to admit that if you are it, you have it, it's with you, and to the degree that you express it, you're handling that substance. You're not without. Okay, here's an, another, here's a cut above. It's on the same principle. But the, the uh, motive, I would say, is perhaps a cut above. We're now in 1 Kings 17. And the word of the Lord came unto Elijah. This is not Elisha now, this is Elijah, the Tishbite. And it's all about that uh, horrible drought that was going to go on. There shall not be dew nor rain these years except by my word. <laughs> there never is. The word of the Lord came unto Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there, gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. I mean, what a place to, the wise God to send Elijah to be sustained through a drought, <laughs> if this is literal. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. Does that sound like taking candy out of the mouths of babes for thus saith the Lord God of Israel the barrel of meal shall not waste neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth and she went and did according to the saying of Elijah and she and he and her house did eat many days and the barrel of meal wasted not neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah now, what did she have in the house? She had meal and she had oil. The word translated meal means to grind into flour. Or in other words, put in the array of capacities, what she had was persistence. She could grind and grind and grind and grind and can't we all? She also had oil dedication. Well, go and do as you have said. Prepare it, but bring it to me first. Bring it to this vision of God, which you, your Elisha is. Your Elijah is not vision of God. Your Elijah is the power of God. Bring it to the power of God. Bring it to omnipotence, which is your spiritual identity. And then when you've done that, there's all in the world left 
for thee and thine cherished ideals. You don't, it doesn't waste away. You can't exhaust it. So it's again the story of supply. This one. We're back again in 2 Kings 4. We're picking it up now at the 8th verse and we'll go on for quite a bit because this one takes a while. This is the Shunammite. It's marvelous. <coughs> and it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, which means quietude, where was a great woman and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is a holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi his servant, and that word is valley. Gehazi is valley of a visionary. You see, this is the vision of God. Elisha is the vision of God. His servant is the valley of the visionary. There are many ramifications of that. It can go on into arrogance and everything else. When you think of it as the servant of the, of the vision of God, then the valley of the visionary seems to fit. So he called unto Gehazi his servant, said, Call this Shunammite. And when he had called her, she stood before him. And he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? In other words, what do you want out of me? <laughs> Sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> Gee, this is too good to be true. What do you want? Wouldst thou be spoken for to the king? Or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. And he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily, she hath no child, and her husband is old. And he said, Call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door. And he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. But the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. In other words, the cherished ideal appears. And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said to his father, My head, my head. And he said to a lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is neither new moon nor Sabbath. You see, that sense of provision was all theoretical, was all the old system-oriented. It isn't new moon or Sabbath. Why do you go to church except on Sunday? Then she said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Slack not thy riding for me except I bid thee. So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel, which is a planted field, productive, to Mount Carmel where Elisha dwells. And it came to pass, when the man of God saw her afar off, that he said to Gehazi his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her, and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. And when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet, but Gehazi came near to thrust her away, and the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her. And the Lord hath hid it from me, I ha and hath not told me. The man of God can perceive. 
Then she said, Did I desire the son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins and take my staff in thine hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. And if any salute thee, answer him not again, and lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. And Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awake. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his own bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon the tw them twain and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands and he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him and the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her. And when she was come in unto him, he said, Take up thy son. Now I know we don't have to draw designs to show you, show you what that means, except perhaps the shutting out of even the... You have to be alone with your selfhood. <coughs> he shut out even the mother and Gehazi, his servant, then, when everything that he had identified as that child was related to himself, his own, in other words, his eyes on his eyes, his hand on his hand, his mouth on his mouth, they were not two things, they were seen as one inseparable being, and then warmth comes into the flesh or the apparency called child ideal. Then he returned and walked to and fro and stretched himself upon him and the child sneezed seven times. You look up the word sneezed, diffused, diffused, quite seven times, these seven elements. <coughs> so then, making this absolutely practical, let us take an actual case. Let us find out the problem analyze it, see what it dramatizes, and from that state find the counterfact on the vertical rod, and then sneeze seven times. Be the mind that understands it. Let, let's take one, I'll take one. Last night, remember I told you how I'd been doing nothing but uh, sopping draining eyes for two days? I come in. I knew you wouldn't let us down totally. I said I knew they weren't here because my water pitch is gone. <laughs> Don't need it. Rain today. <laughs> the child sneezed seven times and was alive. All right. To sneeze is to diffuse. So when I went home last night, I thought I'm not going to put up with this any longer. I've been reading through lakes of water and seeing nothing but muddle and stumbling and going. So, I analyzed the thing. What is it? It isn't an excess of water. It's probably clogged ducts, if I were analyzing it physically. Well, what does that dramatize? The clogged ducts that cause an overflowing constantly. What does it dramatize? The state is obstruction. Well, that's conceivable, but there's no obstruction in the tree of life, it isn't growing there. So, in the tree of life, there grows a feature called freedom, with a small f. And that is when operating the annihilation of any dramatized obstruction. So then, it's one thing to see that, and it's another thing to sneeze seven times with it. So, what you do, is what, at least what I did, I 
shut the door on all externality. And I realized that I, as infinite consciousness, I, infinite consciousness, as mind, recognize limitless self-contained freedom and interpret it as the spiritual, moral, mental, and physical condition of me now. All right, that's sneezing once. I, infinite consciousness, as spirit, constitute limitless self-contained freedom and, outwardly, substantiate it as the spiritual, moral, mental, and physical condition of me now. Sneeze twice. I, infinite consciousness, as soul, embody this limitless self-contained freedom and give it form as my spiritual, mental, uh, moral, mental, and physical condition now. I, infinite consciousness, as principle, control limitless self-contained freedom and direct it as the spiritual, moral, mental, and physical condition of me right now. That's the fulcrum. We've moved over to the living thing. I, infinite consciousness as life, animate this limitless self-contained freedom and perpetuate it as the spiritual, moral, mental, physical condition of me. I, infinite consciousness always, so that I never get the feeling that this is something here doing it. Infinite consciousness as truth reveals limitless self-contained freedom and illustrates it as my spiritual, moral, mental, physical condition at this instant. I, infinite consciousness as love, am satisfied with limitless self-contained freedom and fulfill it as my spiritual, moral, mental, physical condition right now. Now that is the truth. I know it is the truth and I know that I know it. And any truth known is necessarily known by infinite consciousness, which by reason of its infinitude cannot meet or experience a negation or an obstruction, or an obscuration, or a delay. But what consciousness knows stands established as the irrevocable law unto this case. And that was the end of it. I haven't had the physical illustration of it since. So try that with anything. It doesn't make any difference what the, what the uh, symptom, if you will analyze until you find the state of which that symptom is a dramatization, you can, by a process of logic, look within to that tree of life and find in the infinite array of features one that is the exact opposite. And when you have found that, sneeze seven times. <laughs> okay, any question on that? as to how it's done. Then we'll get to the body of what we were planning for tonight. <laughs> the parables. Yes, yes. When Jesus enters into Jerusalem and whips the errors out of the temple and values are changed, he starts teaching them by parables. And there is a verse that says, The disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore, 
All of this is being done in parables. That's why the whole of scripture was written as if it were persons in places doing things, because that is the familiar language of our acceptance. We understand things only that way. Why is it that it is given to you to know the mysteries? It's because you're disciplined. The disciples are already called. They're already disciplined. So it's given to you. But I speak unto them in parables. Well, here's one of the favorites. And he said, a certain man had two sons, and haven't we all, inward and outward. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give the portion of goods that falleth, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. And I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against thee, against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and a ring on his hand. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. We'll halt it there for a minute. What was the first mistake? The son said to the father, Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. His sense of inheritance was divisible. And that's the first mistake. So if that desire was fulfilled and he had got it, however much, it wasn't enough because it was divisible. You cut anything off from its source and it droops, it goes. So he gathered his and he took it out and he spent it in riotous living and he would just as soon have eaten on the externals, the husks that filled the bellies of the swine. And then it says, he came to himself. That's where it was self-seen. He saw what was wrong. He said, I will arise and go unto my father. I will not live externally, solely. I will arise and go unto my father and confess that I sinned, or in other words, I missed the mark. That's why I'm not sharing in the prize. I missed the mark. I didn't see my spiritual identity. So when he starts doing that, you remember the illustration we gave about you look at your own image in the lake, and as you approach it, it approaches you. So as I arise and go into my father, my father sees me and comes to provide because he's seeing himself redeemed. So he has the best there is, all there is. Now his eldest son was in the field. This is the other, the other side of myself. He's in the field, he's not in the house, he's in the field. That should illustrate the Jacob Esau aspect of it. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, thy brother is come. And thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out, and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. <clears throat> but as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, 
and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Now that speaks for itself. The external is never satisfied. It's always the abused one. It's always the one that's afflicted because it is external and believes itself one among many, even billions today. And if you're thinking of yourself as one among many created objects, there are going to be many that will take advantage and you'll chafe. <coughs> That's one. Can I break and tell a joke? It has nothing to do with any of this, but when I said that's what it made me think. Uh, this is, a, say, a century ago in England. And uh, a young couple was married. And after the ceremony, they get into the carriage to ride away for the honeymoon. And they're not very far along their way. And a locomotive comes. And it disturbs the horse. He rears up. And, so the groom gets out, the bridegroom gets out, and uh, gets onto the bridle and, and uh, stills the horse. And with his finger in the side of the horse's head, he says, that's once. And he gets back into the coach, and they start on. Well, something else comes to disturb the horse, and he rears up and nearly upsets the apple cart. So he gets out again goes through the same thing, stills the horse, says, that's twice. Well, the third time it happened, he got out and he didn't go through any of that. He simply stilled the horse and took out his revolver and shot the horse right through the head. And the bride said, that is the cruelest thing I ever saw in my life. What a beast you are. He says, that's once. <laughs> That's not a parable, is it? <laughs> could be, could be, could be. All right, here, here is a parable that we, it says right at the top, this is a parable. <laughs> then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. These, of course, are only five. They're the wise side of your, the wise use of your senses and the foolish use of your senses. Same. But it's told in that way so that you'll find it. They that were foolish took their, they that were foolish took their lamps but took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. In other words, be ready. Have dedication. Don't depend on, don't keep running out to others that buy and sell. Dedicate yourself to these things, dedicate yourself to these features, and illustrate them yourself. And you will find the strength growing every time you do it. The opportunities will come, the bridegroom will keep coming, and you will indeed be ready to go in for the fulfillment. The kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. You know, that wouldn't do today, would it? 
Today, it isn't to everyone according to his own ability. They're going to demand that everybody have equal results right off the bat. We were never promised equal results. We were promised equal opportunity. Now, I know that hasn't always been available, but if that were the way it were being corrected to make sure there is equal opportunity, there would not always be this uh, forever butchering. But that's all coming from the same place that Byrne's question came from the other night. 2,000 years of Christianity as practiced hasn't made a dent in that, in that kind of practice. Okay, then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. <coughs> but he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. The day of reckoning does come. That's when we wake. <clears throat> so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou hast Thou deliveredst unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained five beside them. In other words, I've invested, and it has returned. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. So the same thing is repeated with the one who had two. He had taken them, he had invested, and made two more. Great, enter into the joy of thy Lord. You'll be rewarded because you were faithful. <clears throat> then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gathered where I had not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchanges, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. <coughs> Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that he hath. Does that seem unjust to anybody? Isn't it clear? Mm -hmm. Perfectly clear. It's all being done from one. And either you invest it, either you exercise your spiritual muscle, or you don't. If you do, you have the reward of having done it. The strength is there. If you don't, you're still weak and appealing to others, uh, pleading to others. <laughs> if I use the word appealing, it may have a different connotation. Oh, this is a great one. This is the sh separating of the sheep from the goats. In other words, distinguishing features from states, in a way. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from his goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king come to them on his right hand, and say, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in, naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, whenever saw we thee an hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And then the rest of that is the converse of it, so we won't take the time to go through it. But inasmuch as ye have not done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have not done it unto me. Well, who is out there? the illustration of myself. And that brings <laughs> to mind right here, there's a, you know, we had this illustration from First Kings about this hideous drought that was going on for years and years and years. This story concerns a horrible flood. And there was a preacher 
who was standing on his front steps. And his closest neighbors come by with a truck. We've all been ordered to evacuate. Come with me. We, we will save you from this flood. He said, I am a man of God. The God I serve will save me. So they drove on. The water rises and rises. He's up on the porch, clinging on the posts, and comes by another neighbor in a rowboat. This is your last chance. Get in. Go with us. No, I'm a man of God. The God I serve will save me. Well, they go on in the boat, and the floods continue to rise, and the preacher climbs to the rooftop and to the chimney top, and the water comes and drowns him. So he finds himself walking into heaven, and he confronts God rebelliously, and he said, I served you all these years. Why couldn't you save me? And God said, good God, I sent you a pickup truck and a rowboat and a helicopter and a helicopter. He refused them all. <laughs> Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. God will appear in the language of your acceptance. And if you don't accept it when it first shows up as a pickup truck, and you may not accept it when it shows up as a rowboat, you may not even accept it when it comes as a helicopter to get you off the roof. Well, when you find that you are God himself, it'll come. All right. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. And it's really that simple, it seems. But look and see how accurately that was said, the law itself. What's written? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, that is, with your spiritual perception, and with all thy soul, or your emotional level, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. You see, you have the physical and the mental. It's all there, all four levels. You must, in that sense, sneeze four times. <laughs> Here's another thing that I wish the uh, opportunists in the Holy Land would realize. That this, you know, they'll, if, if you pay them enough, they'll tell you exactly, they'll show you the inn where the Good Samaritan slept, where the Good Samaritan took the, uh, took the uh, man that fell among thieves. They'll show you the inn and all of that. Yet at the top of the page, this is a parable of a Good Samaritan. <laughs> A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And you go from Jericho up to Jerusalem. You go from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Of course. Because Jericho is to anticipate. Jerusalem is where it's the living thing. So a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came a certain priest that way. Here's ecclesiasticism. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, which literally means to loan, to lend or borrow. There's the banker who passes by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, had compassion on him. The word translated Samaritan means watch station. There's the one that's on the lookout and really knows who he is and who he's seeing. So he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, pouring in dedication and inspiration, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go, and do thou likewise. 
Now, there's a great distinction between that kind of practice and the uh, organized charity racket. This is compassion, true compassion. You take this one. When Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, and remember when we, before we got into Jerusalem, he passes by Bethphage and Bethany, and Bethany is contempt. Oh, there's such a contempt and disesteem for the leper. So, when Jesus is in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman, having an alabaster box of very precious ointment, and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. You're always looking at the conceivable states. And the poor as a state is always conceivable. But how often do I remain alive to my spiritual salvation, which is this, which is and is within? You know, that was the hardest thing that I encountered in all those years working at the castle. Touring through one of the aesthetic wonders of the world, which was designed to be a museum of applied arts that would be given when the builder died to the University of California, where they would house their art students and educate them from all of these, these illustrations and ideas. And those who weren't aware of that motivation would invariably say, how could anybody spend so much money on so such uses? And they could have done something good with it. Well, of course, that standpoint of ignorance says a lot. Uh, not knowing the millions and millions that went to charity and all of those uh, for universities, for hospitals, for equipment of hospitals, endowments of hospitals, endowments of universities, scholarships, that sort of thing. It was endless, but it was never put up in neon lights. So those who didn't know it had nothing to judge by but what they were seeing. And then simply means, what purpose for all this waste? Something good could have been done. Well, man does not live by bread alone. This uh, brings us to the end of this uh, organized, this organized <coughs> charity racket, as I call it, is the misuse of that very same talent, that very same gift that the other, that the parable of the Good Samaritan was illustrating, go and do likewise. Always when you see the evidence, the tr evidence of true need, feed it, because inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. But if you're seeing it as a ripoff, don't feed that, or you will get ripped off, ripped off, ripped off, ripped off, on it goes, forever. I had, before I wanted, before we open it for questions, when I came to the platform tonight, here's this wonderful symbol, and I'm sure you can see the design of it if you can't see the words. It's in four quarters of the human soul. I am son of my past, father of my future, thanks to Fred Adams. Isn't that a stunning idea? I am son of my past, father of my future. Okay, let's uh, get this thing on the road. What have you by way of questions? You folks that uh, came in just at that sneezing, I better tell you where that came from so it will have some meaning for you. It's in the uh, fourth chapter of Second Kings about the Shunammite woman, how Elisha manages the uh, healing of that child. He goes up and puts his mouth on the child's, the dead child's mouth, puts his eyes on the dead child's eyes, puts his hands on the dead child's hands, and then 
the breath of life is seen to be the same one and the child sneezes seven times the word to translate sneeze is to diffuse therefore we diffuse it through the seven elements we become the mind that knows it and interprets it outwardly the spirit that constitutes it and substantiates it outwardly that the soul that embodies it and gives it form outwardly the principle that controls it and directs it outwardly the, the life that animates it and perpetuates it outwardly the truth that reveals it and illustrates it evidences it the love that is satisfied with it and fulfills it I have a question in regards to uh, it's probably unfair because I didn't hear the initial part thank you for explaining where you, which book it came out of uh, it appeared as if it was used to resolve a specific physical um, symbol that was apparently out of order. Uh, That's the way it appears, but the child uh, of the Shunammite, was be it was a cherished ideal that was not possible for her to have until she ran afoul of Elisha, uh, the uh, man of vision. And he told her that at this season, at the time of life, she would embrace her son. Didn't seem possible, but she did. In other words, the ideal was realized where it was. Then, when it becomes external to her, and he runs to his father in the field saying, my head, my head. There's and his father says to a servant, take him to his mother, where he goes and sits on her knees until noon and dies. So then she runs to the man of God, and the man of God sends his servant to do certain ritual which doesn't do a thing to raise, rouse the child. Then Elisha himself has to go into the room and put out even the mother, closes the door on them all, and then is the realization there's no one here but I and my perfection. He takes him, he takes him to an upper room, correct? That, that was another one. Uh, that was the one we had second where it says that... Uh, Go on, four times. No, that was three also. Here we are. I don't think we even took that one up, did we, tonight? This was after the widow had, had sustained him through the drought. This is Elijah, another one. The power of God. So he, the widow, after she has sustained him, it says, It came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. In other words, return your cherished ideal to the vision of God. Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he stretched himself upon the child three times. These are in the interpretive levels, you see. Moral, I mean physical, mental, moral. You go through three states before you've plumbed the depth of it. And the, when he stretched him on the child three times, uh, the, uh, he said unto the Lord, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. It is always alive. If it's anything that lives can't die or it wouldn't be life. Death dies because it's a dead thing. It's always dead, it's always conceivable, but always dead, it can't move, it can't do a thing for itself. Life is the animating force of even death. But upon life, the second death hath no power. Yes, I thought I saw a hand. Yeah, I did, I... Um, from Neville, he says uh, God's promise, I will rise up your son after you who shall come forth from your body. I will be his father and he shall be my son. Mm 
I'm, I'm not clear on, on all that's said there. Okay, let's. Uh, Many people are interested in imaginism as a way of life, but are not at all interested in its framework of faith, a faith leading to the fulfillment of God's promise. And this is God's promise. I will raise up your son after you, who shall come forth from your body. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And that is in, from 2 Samuel, and it has to do being born from above. It came forth from his own head, this child which in a few months appeared to him in vision as David, the, the eternal son. And when you say it isn't clear to you, the world raised hell. I mean, Neville's world raised hell when he began speaking this. In fact, we mentioned this over at Viv's the other morning, didn't we? Uh, you see, I was sitting in Neville's audience when he came back from San Francisco after he had that remarkable vision. And he opened a month early because he couldn't wait to tell it. And he told it to a full house. And that auditorium seated 300 people. And he spoke twice a week. That was a Thursday night. Monday night, there were 33 people that came back. Talk about being offended. Thursday night, there were, I believe, 15 or 16, less than 20 anyway. And the next Monday night, it was so drib such dribbles that his agent, Fred Messenger, said, Neville, you have got to stop telling that because you will not have anyone come. He said, then I'll tell it to the bare walls. Neville had been born from above, as it says in Scripture. When you we have it about uh, Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Am I stepping too far away from this thing? I'll follow you. Okay, Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, comes to Jesus by night, that is to say, out of his ignorance of his divinity. And uh, Jesus says, no one can enter the kingdom of God except he be born again. And... Nicodemus says, how can a man be born again? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He says, except ye be born of water and the spirit, ye cannot enter the kingdom. Well, how can these things be? He says, are you a ruler of the synagogue and don't know these things? If we tell you of earthly things and you don't believe, how are you expected to believe me when I tell you of heavenly things? So those who had been listening to Neville exclusively to find out how to picture and get, picture and get, picture and get, when suddenly that piece of scripture had been fulfilled and he was born from above, exactly as it had said. And I have read in his Bible where he would pencil on the margins, well, let us say April 18th, 1962, paralleling when and he had the experience that was told in Scripture. Because all Scripture is fulfilled in the experience of the individual. Not in the flesh any more than the Scripture is the term of flesh. It is all about spirit. So when he had the experience of being David's father, David came and announced himself as his son. It was the David of biblical fame, he said. When he was split, the temple was rent from top to bottom, and up his spine, the golden serpent coiled until it hit the cranium. And then he penciled right across that thing, the temple shall be, shall be, uh, what is it, riven in half. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so shall the Son of Man be lifted up, up to his spiritual recognition. So, I'm not going to, uh, I will raise up your son after you who shall come forth from your body. I will be his father and he shall be my son. Your now, son, your, the son is you. His son, I will be his father and he shall be my son. I think this says it perfectly. I am the son of my past and the father of my future. 
You can read it in uh, the very end of Revelation. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Well, then I must be all that ever went in between. So when we're trying to figure out who is it then in this thing that I am, there's nobody else. I have stages of recognition, but, you know, we took that thing in the uh, 91st Psalm about uh, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. The first sense of him is as he who is dwelling there. A little later on, we speak of him as thou. A little later on, I. You find most of the Psalms do that. It's a transformation of perspective. But the one who is being transformed is the same one. The one, who is it that ascended? But he that first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is none other than the one that ascended up far above all heavens. There's only one to do it. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. But it is I. And Isaiah keeps saying, I, even I am God. There is none beside me. And that isn't Isaiah saying it. Who but God could know there is only God? Well, that was what Neville said when somebody said, What is your degree? He said, MR, mister. <laughs> <laughs> and they wanted to know, didn't, hadn't he ever been ordained? He said, Who could ordain me? <laughs> <laughs> and they call that arrogance. It was anything but. He simply knew, had had the experience of being who he was, and had always been. Yes? We were talking last night about, the, in a manner of speaking, the end of the world. Yes. The whole creation will be consumed and appear into the holy word, and now it was fine, I can forgot. But... I think... Was, go ahead. I was just reading up this morning, and then before that happened, he said the chair with his flaming sword is hereby commanded to leave his guard at Tree of Life. And that's when he, when he leaves the guard of Tree of Life. Then, you see, the, the, the freedom to imbibe the Tree of Life is there, and then all of, all of creation as I have known it previously is consumed, and I now see it, infinite and holy, even as before it appeared finite and corrupt. <coughs> Did I reach that? I don't so think so. If the cherub leaves the guard of Tree of Life, who has a two-edged sword that keeps anybody from approaching, when that cherub leaves his guard, it's wide open for <coughs> our return. It's wide open for my acceptance then. The thing, that two-edged sword, that duality, that has kept me feeding on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is now behind me. He's left his guard of the tree of life and I can freely live on it. Now that isn't something that's going to happen in the future. That's something that is always re being revealed. But it's always being revealed at a certain stage, uh, an elevation of perception. That's the whole book of Isaiah when it tells how the birth of Jesus Christ will be the birth of the Savior. This is a sign that shall be. Well, it happens to everyone at a certain elevation of perception. It isn't something, it isn't a preview of something that's going to happen universally. I mean, individually we come into this world, individually we rise, we go out of it. It isn't a mass, we don't take heaven by storm, someone said. There isn't a mass entrance. Was, did, was that it? Did I get to it? Okay. okay. You haven't had a chance to catch up on the background. Of I should kind of fill me in as to the seven aspects and how different they were from what we usually yeah. learned. So. Oh. Well, it's just enough. It's just... We keep advancing, that's all. Mm -hmm. There's no fixed thing. If you try to fix something and keep it pinned down like a butterfly to a board, you are in trouble because the thing is a moving, living thing. And unless you advance 
and go with it. That doesn't mean we have to accept everything we see in the world and go along with every stream of that. But, I mean, the idea is unfolding all the time. Unless you advance and go with it, where it takes you. That's why systems have so frozen these uh, organized religions. They have so frozen the form. And they go through such rituals. Beautiful though they may be, it is only rarely that you can see someone do it that it doesn't seem perfunctory. I have been moved to tears not very, not long ago by the total dedication to, a, to that certain ritual, which before had seemed so dull and so tedious and so boring. But to see it when someone who is doing it is so honestly in it, feeding it, feeding it with his own spiritual perception that it took on such a beauty that I could see why it has lasted. But that's rare. Forms have a way of corroding. In fact, Jim and I were talking about that last night. I said that it's, it, I've always felt that if schools, uh, if churches would do it the way schools do it, it would be so healthy because individually you go to school, you learn the groundwork, you get your sea legs in a way, and then you're graduating. You go out to test it and you put it to the work. Well, somebody else comes in and learns and goes and on it goes, but it keeps itself full healthy because it's not so overloaded. Churches, on the other hand, have a way of getting you in and signed up and to sh appear to prosper in the world, they must be seen to have numbers and great, great, great numbers. And then that organization gets so constipated with members that it simply becomes ineffectual. It isn't a living, moving, happening thing. Now that isn't always the case, <coughs> but I'm saying largely the effort to organize and to keep down in fact, just let me look ahead and see if I didn't take this. Yeah, it's all right. We've, we, we've got the thing coming up, so I'm not going to blast it in your question period. Go ahead. Yes. Um, you're, uh, you're, you're saying just a, another thousand to get over the hump. I equate with Vivian's phrase, get to getting. And I wonder what was the phrase, please? Get to getting, which is let's get on to getting more. Yeah. You know, like like what I would call self will out there trying to have mm -hmm. its day. Mm -hmm. um, these the seven aspects, as they are affirmed and and dealt with. What, if anything, is there to stop persona from attempting its new Cadillac or uh, so and so to shave their mustache or so and so to get up? to come across with something, you know, manipulation yeah. and into personalities. Not a thing in the world is to stop it. But you see, the human self is being evangelized all the time. And it is our business to accept that process and not try to take heaven by storm, but to abandon as fast as practical those little nagging attempts at manipulation and so forth and move on to the spiritual, which determines the outward and apparent. Not sure well, maybe I didn't get the question accurately. Would you uh, go over the... I mean, what, what, what about... The people who picture and get, picture yeah. and get, picture yeah. and get. Okay, I mean, they're out... I, I feel, when you use that phrase, they're out there rubbing their hands, thinking about the next mm -hmm. um, goodie that's, that's coming their way. That's right. Which keeps them locked into the illusion that something outside of them is going to fix this inside problem. That's right. Now, if, if these aspects are a means to uh, bring something to a fulfillment, what is to keep them from picturing their own reward and then, even if it works, bringing it into play to keep them more asleep than ever? Not a thing, and that's why they are. That's why they are. You, the law does not change. It still outpictures for you your conviction. And if you're asleep in this stage, and you move on that horizontal bar forever and ever, you're not awakening much. 
In other words, the self is not being evangelized effectively. And what's to stop them from doing it to their own destruction? Nothing. But they're not destroyed. Only the process for them is destroyed. Because the one who's doing it is the one who sees that logic at a certain point and rouses himself. I remember someone using that process, we told this, it was an actual case, a woman, she wanted so desperately to have this pink Cadillac and she imagined it in her garage. No, that wasn't it. Uh, first of all, she imagined the house, the, the house that uh, she just had to have. Well, the house had a two-car garage and the house was one that she couldn't pay the gas bill in it, but she had to have it. So by her vivid imagining that they had it, they had it. By whatever the burden was, I don't know, but they had it. All right, then she must have this pink Cadillac in the garage. Well, she did the same thing. She pictured and got. What? She lost the house and the people that took it off their hands had a pink Cadillac. <laughs> Her vision of a pink Cadillac in that garage was fulfilled. It wasn't hers. <laughs> Pity. <laughs> you picture and get. It just is, this is why I say select, you noticed in, in the very first step, in the seven steps in I do, the first one is select an ideal. That ideal you select from the vertical rod of the tree of life. And then you construct a scene that makes it, if true, you, that, that is illustrated in language that is satisfactory to you. And then you live in that and you make it appear. But it's the ideal that you select, not, a, not the Cadillac. You select the ideal of omnipresence. And that will be illustrated in the means most suitable to your use. <coughs> In other words, you, you, you select the, the greatest ideal would be the vehicle. The ideal, the ideal is always a spiritual idea. Mm -hmm. And as long as you will recognize that that's in you, then you can admit, get the feeling of actually embodying it. And then that will illustrate itself in the language most suited to your present use. Like if you're freezing to death, it won't show up as lace gloves. It'll come as warm mittens or something. If you select the ideal of fulfillment, that's going to come as something that will truly fulfill, not what you may have pictured. I can remember this man that had been through the system, and he came to me and wanted me to work for him to be, get rid of his wife, who was the mother of his five children, so that he could marry this mother of five other children who was married to someone else. And I said, well, I just don't currently feel that I can dedicate my efforts to that, uh, that uh, wish. And he said, but uh, she is so beautiful, she is so wonderful, and we are so in love. And I said, well, you must at one time have felt that about the one you're now trying to dismiss. Oh, but he said, uh, she isn't that way at all. She's so hateful and she's such a nag. And he went on and described what she is to him today. And I said, well, how do you know that in another five years, this one won't be the witch of Ember? <laughs> I mean, there's no way to tell. Your, your view changes as you become familiar with something. I said, I will work that you be fulfilled. I will select this, this ideal of fulfillment and I will see you in it but I won't put a face on it for you. It'll come in the thing that's going to be most suitable so that you will truly feel satisfaction and fulfillment. I saw a hand back there, too. Yeah, uh, on Chris's question, uh, it brought to mind Pilgrim's Progress, the first part of the book, the cross-references that are footnoted. I have never seen such a composition a collection of use of the law and scriptural references as that as Pilgrim's Progress. If you want to take the time to look them up, my thinking must have hit every single man is not justified by the law in the first half of the book. And it was I it was very informative. I have never seen that many references pulled out uh, on misuse of the law. 
And the characterizations that he has executing those misuses are fantastic. It's well worth the reading. Do you have the edition that Blake did the Blake did the illustrations for that? He did. Yes, I have that I have that in the heritage. It's a marvelous thing. Marvelously done. Is that Milton's? No, there is a that's Bunyan. Pilgrim's Progress. But he did Blake did the illustrations to Milton also. I have that. If anybody is interested in the Blake Library, come see me sometime. I need space to house it. Yes. I read something by a Scottish minister that seemed to illustrate very succinctly what you've been saying and what Chris was addressing himself to. Not to imply that you weren't succinct, but to Oh, come now. <laughs> you said this. An undivided mind and heart that worships God alone and trusts him as it should is raised above anxiety <coughs> Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and these things will be added unto you. The undivided mind. Yes, <clears throat> that's the thing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's the undivided mind and heart. Then these things will be added. But if you're dividing your attention between the need and what you feel would like you would like to have come and fill it, that's a schizophrenic view, isn't it? Yes. Doesn't that also become anything that you give power to is idolatry, and, and because God is a jealous God, what you <laughs> yeah it backfires. Regardless. It does. There's no question. It backfires. When Neville had a lecture once called "Count the Cost," that was essentially what it was about. You may go ahead and select these scenes that are terribly explicit, but you should count the cost. Because it brings everything else for something else to be resolved. That's why if you take satisfaction and fulfillment and all of these things that are spiritually real ideals, they cannot backfire. They will bring you indeed in the dramatized version something else to, to uh, resolve. But it won't be in the sense of a backfire. It will always be an ascension. Up, up. Remember that, uh, the Charlie Brown, the cartoon, the Peanuts. Uh, very philosophically, Linus was saying, oh, life has its ups and downs, its ups and downs. And Lucy, the, the little uh, shrew, said, why must it have ups and downs? I want nothing but ups, ups, ups. And Charlie Brown says, oh, good grief. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. On uh, counting the costs, I recall <clears throat> uh, one of my earliest experiences of success in the law. <coughs> I was a young teenager and the Untouchables had just hit TV. And I was really impressed. I just loved those cops and machine guns sticking out of those old 32 <laughs> limos and mowing down people. I just had to have one of those. I mean, every teenager, that's the, that's the epitome of gun chef, right? <laughs> and so, sure enough, I got an opportunity to get one about five years later. almost got killed getting it. It was shooting at me when I first saw it. And uh, that was the price I had to pay to get it. Mm. And ultimately, I just traded it for a six-pack of beer. <laughs> <laughs> Better off, huh? Yeah. Yes. When I first heard Neville, I um, used the loft for a grand piano. It would fit in my rather small living room. And I got my grand piano. It's a little music box that sings my swan song. Did you all hear that? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Well, we've all heard of those people that use the law just that way. Like someone said, she would. Uh, she had to get the feeling of having money. She had to get the feeling of having money. So she counted out tens and twenties, and she would, in her imagination, just pile them up and pile them up. And her poverty made her take the first job she could get, and she was a teller in a bank. <laughs> <laughs> yes, friend. As to your imagination, I've noticed something being up here about your alluding to your black, the blackboard. 
to your left. Oh, my blackboard here, yes. Yes, and uh, I want to prove to you that it doesn't pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> I should learn, you know, there is something about... I had this, this old lady friend in Los Angeles when I lived there, and she was forever telling us about her mother, who was one of these strange people. And what happened was, she said to her sister sitting there by, because I was carrying on making this gesture about something, which was terribly clear to me. But one of the sisters looked to the other and she said, yes, mother had a friend. Went like this. Well, I didn't know what she was talking about, so she had to tell me the story. And the story was this. One day, the mother was talking to the girls. She said, you know, I had a friend once, and she went on describing the friend, telling all these wonderful things, and all the while holding these fingers like that. And finally, Edie said, good God, mother, was she a pygmy? <laughs> oh, oh no, I had a porcelain miniature of her. <laughs> she had given her a porcelain miniature of herself. But <laughs> when she would say, I have a friend, the best thing she could think of was that exquisite little <laughs> image of her friend. <laughs> so I should remember my blackboard here. Uh, well, it's in your minds, isn't it? What, when you see the sun, do you not see a red disc of fire about the size of a guinea? <laughs> no. Whatever the enlarged and numerous senses can perceive. Yes. You've been talking about the fulcrum tonight, I understand. Yes, I'm saying only that this was the fourth night of seven sessions. The fourth session of seven sessions. What I got out of it is that I found out that I am the fulcrum. You are indeed, and I hope everybody got that. Because it all hinges on me. None of it hinges on this, on the person. But that which knows itself as me is the one who knows itself as all of its ideas of itself. And therefore everything hinges on the one who says I. So here we go tomorrow, off to the, good, the last supper. And then on to Good Friday. And then the entombment. And then the resurrection. So good night. Can Jenny come and gorge? Can Jenny come what? And gorge. And gorge. Jenny's gorging all, I've been seeing Jenny gorging, but she's eating the right stuff. Thank you.